Hello everyone. In this seminar, myself and Professor Grant Kovic will go over the very fundamentals of IPD technology. Before we start, I should briefly introduce our university and the research group. The University of Auckland is the top ranked university in New Zealand, and it is also ranked among the top 100 in the world. Both of us come from the Department of Electrical, Computer and Software Engineering, which is one of the five departments in the Faculty of Engineering. Our Power Electronic Research Group is one of the strongest research group at the University of Auckland, and we have over 45 members. Over the past few decades, we have been involved in developing over 100 key patent families in the field of wireless power transfer. Currently, we collaborate on a number of uh, different large-scale multidisciplinary projects targeting electrification of transportation. In the first section of this seminar, we will analyze the power flow between two coils of, the, of an IPD system. IPD is only one of the technologies that enables wireless power transfer. Wireless power transfer can be divided into two broad categories as radiative transmission and non-radiative field transmission. IPD as well as CPT are examples of non-radiative wireless power transfer technologies. However, IPD is the most mature technology as it has been used in industry applications since the 90s. With regards to the radiative wireless power transfer, there are a number of companies developing technologies. As an example, here we see we charge uh, beaming IR light to devices that need to be powered. On the other hand, Energus uses RF beaming to transfer power wirelessly. CPD technology too has improved considerably over the past decade, but it's still mainly used to transfer power over shorter distances, like in this case, in a slip ring. However, there has been work on, uh, for example, one wire CPT that allows power transfer over a larger air gap. As we know, IPT technology is currently used in many industrial applications and in consumer products. The primary of an IPT system derives power typically from the utility grid through a PFC stage that drives a high frequency inverter. The high frequency inverter drives a primary coil through a compensation network to set up a time varying magnetic field that intercepts with the secondary coil or the pickup coil. The pickup coil feeds a rectifier through a compensation network to deliver power to the output DC load. To date, IPD technology that enable both uni and bidirectional power flow have been developed using numerous converter to topologies, control techniques, and compensation networks. These systems can transfer tens of kilowatts at efficiencies as high as 97%. Various coil types have been developed to allow power transfer across larger air gaps while also being tolerant to misalignment. Grant will talk more about these coil designs in his part. Let's first model the behavior of the primary and the pickup coils of an IPD system. Assume we know the self-inductances of the coils, as well as the mutual inductance between them, which are related to each other through the coupling factor between the coils. We can use this information and the T-equivalent model of a transformer to represent the two coils of an IPD system as shown here. Now, the self-inductance we can simply measure by using an LCR meter and measuring the inductance of each coil while the other coil is open circuited. To determine the coupling factor or the mutual inductance, we typically measure the inductance of let's say the primary coil when the secondary coil is shorted. This information is used in this relationship here to obtain the coupling factor. Though we can use a T equivalent model, usually IPD circuits are analyzed using the coupled main inductor model shown here. The voltages induced across each coil due to the current in the other coil is related to the operating frequency and the mutual inductance as given here. 
the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current of a pickup coil can be used as a measure of the power transfer capability of an IPD system. However, we can more accurately describe the power transfer across the air gap using the coupled inductor model. Here, the power received by the pickup coil is simply VSR times the current IST times the power factor angle between them. We can simplify this to relate the power transfer to the VS in each coil as given here. There's going to be copper and core losses in the primary and pickup coils when they are conducting current. The losses in a coil is typically represented by the coil quality factor as given here. Using the coil quality factors, we can express the total power loss as a function of v VAs in each coil. Typically, the losses in the coils account for a significant portion of the power losses. Therefore, it is advantageous to operate the coils at a point where the losses in them is a minimum. We can derive and show that this happens simply when the VAs in the coils are distributed according to their quality factors. To highlight the importance of distributing VAs according to the coil chaos, let's look at an example. As evident from this table, regardless of the coupling factor, maximum efficiency occurs when the VAs are distributed equally since the coils have the same quality factors. Here is an example that you can work through to further understand the concepts we covered so far. So far, we learned that regardless of all the fancy converters and compensation networks used in an IPD system, the power transfer is simply the product of the coupling factor and the square root of the VAs in each coil. So why do we need compensation networks? Let's look at an uncompensated pickup that delivers power to a load represented as an AC resistor RL. Assume that the primary has a fixed current IPT. We can easily determine the power transfer to the load RL as shown here. If we plot power against the ratio between the impedance of the pickup coil and RL, then we can see that the maximum power delivered happens when this ratio is 1. Not only that, when, for example, if the K is equal to 0 0.1, to deliver 5 milliwatts, we need to supply 1 VA into the primary coil. This is not going to be so efficient if we had to do it in, pra in a practical situation where we had to transfer hundreds of watts. To overcome the impedance of the pickup coil that limits the power transfer, we can compensate its impedance using a series connected capacitor as here. In this case, we can think of the pickup as an ideal voltage source, VSR, that supplies the load, RL. However, do note that in practice, we cannot perfectly cancel out the impedance of the coil, so there will be some remaining impedance in series in this circuit. If the pickup behaves as an ideal voltage source, the power it supplies to the load RL will increase linearly as RL reduces towards zero. However, in practice, due to the small impedance that is not cancelled out perfectly, we will see a drop in power transfer as RL reduces beyond a point, as shown in this diagram. Here is an example that you can work through to understand how a series compensated pickup behaves. The pickup coil can also be parallel compensated as shown in this diagram. We can use the Norton transformation to show that the parallel compensated pickup behaves as a current source. One key difference though between a parallel compensated and a series compensated pickup is that the parallel compensated pickup can only be perfectly compensated at a specific RL value. For all other RL values, there will be a residual inductance or a capacitance um, that 
the primary would see uh, due to the mistuning of the pickup coil. When analyzing a pickup, regardless of its tuning topology, we do need to also account for variations in component values. For example, the inductance of the the self-inductance of the pickup coil can change as the displacement between the pickup and the primary coil changes. For example, as we see here, in a practical pickup, the power transfer to RL drops after a certain point depending on the variations in component values from its ideal value. In this case, we are looking at a parallel compensated pickup. Here is an example that you can work through to understand how a parallel compensated pickup behaves. LCL compensation networks are also employed in the pickups in some designs. Power transfer characteristics of an LCL pickup, LCL compensated pickup is somewhat similar to that of a parallel compensated pickup. However, an LCL compensated pickup, like a series compensated pickup, can be perfectly compensated independent of the RL value so that it reflects a real load onto the primary coil. As you can see here, uh, in an LCL compensated pickup, the mistuning also impacts the power transfer. And as RL increases beyond a certain point, the power transfer starts coming down. As you can see here, if we analyze the LCL compensated pickup, we can see that the mistuning between components due to variations in component values has an impact on its power transfer as well. And you could see, uh, depending on this mistuning, the power transfer decreases when RL increases beyond a certain value. Here's an example that you can work through to understand how an LCL compensated pickup behaves. As you can see here, we can partially series compensate the pickup coil. This helps increase in the VA in the pickup coil and therefore increase the power transferred at a specific RL value. Here's an example that shows how series compensation can be used to improve the design or to transfer more power. The ratio between the impedance of the pickup coil to RL that we used earlier is typically called the quality factor of is the ratio of the impedance of the pickup coil to RL that we used earlier in our plots is typically called the operating quality factor of the pickup. Higher operating quality factors helps us transfer more power as we saw, but it makes the pickup more sensitive to variations in component parameters as we discussed earlier. Now that we know why it is essential to compensate the pickup coil, let's investigate the reasons for compensating the primary coil. In order to understand how the primary behaves, Let's represent the compensated pickup and its attached load as an impedance that reflects an impedance back onto the primary coil that's in series with it. The value of this reflected impedance onto the primary coil can be given by this expression here. Directly driving the primary coil through the inverter requires the inverter inverted to source a large amount of VA in order to transfer real power to the load attached to the pickup. For example, to deliver one watt, we need to, the inverter needs to source in excess of one over K squared times the operating queue of the pickup. And this in a practical system is quite excessive. We can reduce this VA stress on the inverter by compensating the pickup impedance of the pickup coil using a series connected capacitor. If both the primary and the pickup are perfectly series tuned, then the inverter will see a purely real load, which is a scaled version of RL. 
the scaling is a function of the mutual inductance as given here. Here are a couple of examples that you can work through to understand how series series and series parallel compensated IPD systems behave. We can also use LCL compensation in the primary side. An LCL compensated pickup can be analyzed using Norton transformation to show that it helps the inverter to see a purely resistive load when pickup is perfectly compensated. Here are a couple of examples that you can work through to understand how LCL to series and LCL to parallel compensated IPD systems behave. We can also partially series tune the coil of an LCL tuned primary to increase the power transfer, especially if the inverter voltage is limited. This helps increasing the VA that's in the primary coil and therefore increasing the power transfer. Here's an example that you can work through to understand how a partially series compensated primary behaves. A summary of the analysis we have done so far is presented in this table. As we established earlier, the power flow is independent of the compensation type as it, simply, as it is simply equal to the product between the coupling factor and the square roots of the VAs in each coil. Alternatively, we can write it in terms of the coupling factor squared times the VA in the primary times the operating quality factor as shown here. The main difference between each system is the equivalent impedance seen by the primary inverter. For example, if the pickup is parallel tuned, as you can see from here, the impedance the primary inverter sees always has a reactive component, while if the pickup is series or LCL tuned, the primary sees a real impedance. This is assuming that both primary and the pickup compensation networks are tuned perfectly. Here is an example design of a 2 kW IPD system that you can follow to understand the design process. That's the end of my part of the presentation. Next, Grant would be talking about magnetic structures and magnetic designs used in inductive power transfer systems. Before I conclude, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped me develop these slides that I presented during this presentation. You could also find more information about what we do in our group on our website, wirelesspower.github.io. There are also lectures listed in this website that has an numerous information about the work we do. It's still work in progress. We will be adding more information as we go in the future. Thank you very much for participating in this seminar. And now I'll hand over to Grant. Well, good afternoon all. My name is Grant Kovac. I'm a professor at the University of Auckland, Department of Electrical computer and software engineering. And I'm going to carry on from Dilipa and talk a little bit about the magnetics of this program. In terms of the work that we've been doing, I want to talk a little bit about the work that's happened over the last three decades for electric vehicle charging and wireless power. Uh, as you can see here, I want to talk a little bit about the various types of couplers and where we might be taking those in our future systems. I'm going to start with non-polarized couplers because they're the most common and even these types of couplers were considered by Tesla. Um, so a non-polarized coupler is typically a circular or a square coil. Um, it would have a ferrite backing. Here it's shown as radiated ferrite pieces, but it could just be a full ferrite sheet and aluminium at the, at the back. And so conceptually what is going on is that in the center there's a ferrite and that ferrite launches a field which is then captured on the other side uh, here with uh, on the other side of the ferrite and when we consider that field being launched we're interested in capturing that field on in a secondary coil which is, which is positioned above it what we're also looking at doing is trying to actually stop that field 
from going into places where we don't want it to be, for example, chassis on a vehicle or where a human might be. And so this is just some indication of that. Obviously, the, the ferrite itself acts to guide the field, but we often place an aluminium shield in behind with a little bit of distance between it and the ferrite to try and block any uh, stray field. But we can further block that stray field if we add a little bit of lip to that. And you can see the difference uh, with and without the lip. So this is without the lip. And this is with the lip in terms of pulling in and constraining the uh, the leakage fields. Now, obviously, we don't want to pull that lip too close because we've got to allow for these field lines to enter and exit the ferrite um, as they are being pushed from the, the actual coil. This was represented in one of the first systems which we were able to demonstrate in 2009 at EBS 24, where we could show that a system like this could actually transfer power at the efficiencies of a plug-in charger. And the key here is that the transformer that we're cre creating, this Lucy coupled transformer, doesn't create a lot of loss at all. And so long as we make these coils really high quality, then in fact there's no reason why a wireless power system shouldn't be almost as efficient as a plug-in system. The one challenge with a circular coupler is it has some limitation if we want to keep its size small in terms of its tolerance to misalignment. So if the vehicle starts pulling away or is not parked accurately, then the coupling between the primary and secondary is going to drop. Now this is indicated here by the uh, volt amps that are collected into the secondary, that open circuit voltage times a short circuit current that Dilipa discussed, and he called it SU, or here I've called it PSU. Uh, but you can see that as the, the secondary is moved and pushes away, this drops rapidly. This is an indication of the coupling drop. And of course, when the secondary is placed directly over the center of the coil of um, of the primary, so it's moved such that it's here, then effectively we've got so little coupling that it's very difficult to actually transfer any power. And so uh, you can see that that happens before the secondary could even move. If there was another coil in proximity, there would be a power null all around the, uh, the this coil. So that led us to start thinking about, well, are there other couplers which maybe can actually have a better tolerance to movement and for coupling, particularly if we're thinking about systems which need wider tolerance for, for parking, but we don't want to make them too large. And polarized couplers are one of those. A typical polarized coupler might be a solenoid. Um, here we're showing a solenoidal system, but we're using two coils and we're acting one to push and pull the field through the ferrite, and we're launching it from each of these uh, ferrite ends and trying to minimize the ferrite here, but we could make a bit large ferrite lump. Essentially, you can imagine that the field is being launched and then it's being collected on the other side. The problem is obvious, it wants to do it on both sides. And so we want, we need to find a way to, to minimize the field from actually being launched in both directions. But it does do something that's quite nice. It gives us a much larger uh, separation between the poles for a given size of a pad. And that's sort of indicative here when we do the comparison between the circular and solenoid. The circular, as you can see, launches a field vertically from the center and then collects it uh, in all directions. But the actual typical height of that field is on average something like the diameter of this coil divided by four. That's the typical height. Whereas if you take a solenoid, you can launch it from the ends, you can almost double that height. But then you've got to try and protect the field and stop it from operating in the opposite direction. We do that typically with an aluminium shield, but you can see here that the aluminium shield itself is obviously now, if it's present, is going to have some loss in it. So we can kind of indicate how good the systems are by looking at the quality, that's the, the, the reactance over the resistance. So in a typical circular inductor, we, we might at 20 kilohertz, it might be around about 300. The, the solenoidal system without the aluminum shield at the back is sitting close to that, but as soon as we put the shielding, this eddy current loss is dropping it, and that means too much loss. 
The other difference you can actually see here is that while the center fields from the circular are vertical, the center fields from a solenoid are horizontal. So there's some difference in terms of the kind of fields that are the, sh the shape of fields at the center of the pads. And we'll come to that a little bit later. But if I take two circular cores and place them out of phase with each other on a piece of ferrite, then I can get a similar kind of result to what I'm seeing with the solenoid system, but it's naturally now single-sided. This led to the development of the double D system, where, um, where you can see that we have a, a, some ferrite in the back and we have a single uh, figure eight winding and you and you can actually push the field pole the poles out and therefore launch this field flux height higher by just uh, uh, spreading the winding in the middle and this uh, when you look at the quality of the pad is excellent it's it's similar to, or even slightly better than the circular um, but it's single-sided naturally uh, whereas the circular coil is similar in all directions in terms of its coupling the double d actually is is much better in the y direction crosswise than it is in the x direction the x direction is obviously if the if the secondary ends up moving so that it's centered over the pole we also drop our coupling to zero and that's typically more uh much more difficult in the x direction to get that tolerance so we end up uh, shaping the double Ds at, in like at about 50% longer in the X direction to get uh, much better tolerance in both the X and the Y. If we want to do a comparison between these two, you can actually have a look at them with similar areas and inductances, driving VA and seven kilowatt output. And what you can show is that the circular system has a, a, a seven kilowatt zone, which is about half of what the double D does but this is more of an oval shaped. And you can also make them interoperable. So the interoperability is shown here, but because the circular system produces a vertical field at the center and the double D produces a horizontal field at its, its center, they're actually interoperable or couple with each other when they're offset. So you can see that the natural offset rate regions are shown here. And in fact, when you place a double D over the coil of a circular, it captures power and vice versa. And these sort of systems have been evolved. Uh, the systems were shown with um, to be much better than 90% efficiency for seven kilowatt systems. Nowadays, of course, 11 kilowatt systems in the future is moving upwards all the time. This leads us to the concept of multi-core couplers. Multi-core couplers have been discussed because they provide wider misalignment tolerance, better transition potentially for if you're looking at a system which has uh, got movement, whether it's a taxi stand or whether it's moving dynamic because they can capture a wider range of field. They obviously have reduced sensitivity varying coupling and you can control the leakage fields. And they also use the ferrite much better, but they add complexity. So why is all of this? I want to talk a little bit about this. The first kind of modi coil that you can create is simply to bring together the double D and the circular coil. So here we have a classic case. We've got a double D sitting on ferrite and we've got a, a circular placed right in the center. What you can imagine if that is either as a secondary or primary is the circular coil is interested at the center with vertical fields and the double D is interested at the center with horizontal fields. So they're completely orthogonal. And this works quite well if you, if you can imagine this as a secondary and I'll also talk about it as a primary a bit later. But if you, if you take a double D primary and you place above it a double D and a circular secondary, which is a multi-coil, then you can imagine that when the, it's centered, the double D coil on the secondary will capture field. But when it's off center, uh, now the circular on the secondary will capture field. And so therefore, what we're doing is we are, as we're taking movement, when, when the double D would naturally drop off and uh, the circular picks up the field power and vice versa. Other options for doing similar things are a bipolar coil. It's exactly the same operation, except we can actually 
take two circular cores and then we spatially offset them so that they do not see each other. They're essentially completely independent. That means we can tune them independently, we can operate them independently. And it turns out that if you do that, you can actually capture exactly the same kind of field as you do in a, in a double D with quadrature. Um, and you've got slightly less to um, design tolerance because they've got to be identical, but you can actually um, do very, very similar operations. And when you put one of these multi-coils on a primary, what do you get? Well, here's a circular on circular zone, and here's a multi-coil on that same circular primary. And you can see you get about a three times uh, coupling uh, range where you can couple the kind of power. This is a seven kilowatt zone versus the smaller seven kilowatt zone for circular on circular. If I use the double D and I use the uh, a multi-call DDQ on top of it, you can see again, I've made it three times larger. So this is one of the reasons for using it on a secondary, very good if you're using a, a taxi or moving vehicle on a dynamic highway. As a primary, it also has a lot of benefits. So one of the pieces of work that's been done recently is to compare what if I took the GA, the ground assembly for the standards and, and replicated it with a bipolar uh, two coil um, system, which is independent of each other. Now, this gives us a lot of flexibility because we have two cores, we can change their, their, their currents and we can change their phases, but we could also just either operate just one or the other. And so one of the benefits you've got of this is if the vehicle is offset and you normally have just one coil, you can see that we produce a lot of field on the primary to capture a small amount of field in the secondary when it's completely offset. On the other hand, if you had two coils here, we can turn the coil off on this side, just leave this one on and we can capture the field into that secondary and generally we can do a lot better. So when you do a comparison of this, you can see that the, the ground assembly which is circular to either a circular or a double D actually works really well. But if you use a multi-coil, we can actually make it even work better uh, with lower leakage by just even just energizing one of those coils. So the we don't actually have to energize them both and we can actually get an improvement in, in, in power transfer and efficiency. When we're looking to go to higher power systems, then we might even want to go to three phase systems. And here's one example of a three coil system. We've got, uh, these are all independent coils, but there are other options. And when we do a bit of a comparison at 20 kilowatts for a, a system like this, which has got three coils where we can operate them, or um, to a circular system or three phase to three phase, or using them in all ways which we can imagine, we're designing it so there's no mutual coupling between these coils, but everything can couple to the secondary or vice versa. And when we do those kind of analyses, we can show that in fact the actual power transfer uh, for 20 kilowatts, we can actually produce the same power transfer with lower leakage if we use one of these three coil systems. And that's true with a, in the comparison against uh, the best circular and circular. So a lot of work has been done recently about trying to do that. Here's a DD uh, to DD and a Q system being proposed by uh, at Utah State University as a, as a potential mechanism for really maximizing the field and controlling the leakage on the outside. Uh, similar kinds of designs uh, when we're going to 50 kilowatts. So what's been happening is people have been looking at, we need to get height with power transfer, double Ds look quite good. How do you manage, how do you manage the failed leakage? And you can see that with Ornell, they've recently proposed the use of a three double Ds separated 120 degrees operating to give you good usage of field and good usage of um, the ferrite structure. But we could also move towards in-road ferritless designs. Um, if we want to actually go to ferritless, then there's the potential to actually energize the coil and try and couple power without any physical ferrite in the system. The challenge with this is, of course, you're now reducing the coupling uh, and you're not, and field could go in both directions. So what this has been shown here is you can use a reflection coil, 
which is a core wound in the opposite direction, spread out in such a way that it actually stops the field going in the opposite direction. If you design this coil appropriately, you can actually ensure that it actually also kills the leakage on the side. And the kind of designs have been done here with a uh, ferritless double D as an example. Here's a full ferrite system. And here's a ferritless system with no, uh, a complete ferritless system with a reflection coil and a system where you've just got small amounts of ferrite. The difference being is that the leakages on these systems, and particularly this one, is much smaller, almost halved compared to a full throat system, but you pay a price because you almost have to double the VA in this. So you're trading off the VA in the system for, for lower leakage and lower ferrite that cannot break. So where are we heading with future road systems? Well, the challenge is that we want to actually have systems which will, which will potentially be able to park on the road stationary. We want to move towards semi-dynamic and we want to move towards around town uh, dynamic systems. But they actually have to survive in the road. And if they've got to survive in the road, they've got to be cheap, they've got to be uh, higher power. And so the challenge is how do we actually move towards an in-road vision where we can actually, actually take these, they will last the distance and We'll, should they be small pads or should they be tracks? And that's the kind of work where the future is working towards today. So I'm going to stop here and thank you for listening.